All right. Uh, happy, hey, everybody. Welcome. Happy Earth Day tomorrow. I'm Howard Tierski. Welcome to the Winning Digital Customers Show. And today we are going to talk about green in the context of digital. In honor of Earth Day, I want to kind of take a few minutes and look at the question, is digital helping us be more green? There's no question that over the last 100 years, technology of various sorts, the industrialization of this country and of the world, has contributed very significantly to our uh, pollution problems, to the environmental problems. I think there can be no doubt. Uh, and a question is, is the latest technology potentially helping to solve that problem and shift us more into an Earth-friendly mode? I think it's actually interesting to look at some things that are, and also some aspects of our digital world that actually may be harmful to the environment. So in honor of Earth Day, today we are going to look at the question of how green is digital. And uh, by the way, we are now not only uh, streaming live on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn, as we have been doing for some time, but we are now experimentally uh, in a clubhouse room as well. So uh, we'll be going over the live cast content in clubhouse room. Of course, you can ask questions on LinkedIn and YouTube and Facebook as always. But if you would like to join us in Clubhouse, we are in the Social Media Connect Club on Clubhouse, which is open to all. And we have a room there for this live cast as well. And I'll stay a little bit on afterwards if anyone would like to chat about the things that we're talking about. Um, and by the way, for anyone who's joining us, throw in the comments. Let me know where are you joining from. I'd be just really interested in knowing if you're in one of those other platforms where you are uh, listening from today. And uh, and and how and how's your Earth Day? Of course, tomorrow is technically Earth Day, but how's your Earth Day going so far? Okay, so let's dive in on some of the stuff we want to talk about today. So first of all, when it comes to the topic of green, this is as you know, if we think, I know many of the people listening to this show are in business. You're working for large companies in marketing or IT or product development or operations, and there's no question that the the environmental concern not only in my opinion should be of concern to all of us because well we all live here right <laughs> we, we need to make sure this planet is going to be uh, in good shape for the rest of our lives and for our children i have five children i want to make sure they they are able to uh make it through their lives and hopefully future generations so clearly i don't think we need to um uh, have a strong argument as to why we should all be individually concerned about the environment but i do think that sometimes our companies have a hard time prioritizing it because, well, after all, their ultimate responsibility is the bottom line to their shareholders, or at least most companies look at it that way. And so it can be difficult sometimes to prioritize an environmental choice in business if that isn't affecting your profitability. And so uh, the good news is in that regard, there's plenty of data to support that in environmental awareness, being environmentally responsible is increasingly important to uh, to consumers and particularly these next generation of consumers, millennials and younger. One study that was recently done said that uh, when they asked Generation Z, 93% of people in Generation Z said that they thought it was very important that brands be thinking about how not only they make a profit, but have a positive impact on the environment. And that was an important consideration in their choices as consumers. So we see this topic being not only important to all of us as individuals, but increasingly important to running an effective business and having a brand that consumers are, uh, you know, feel resonance with that, that brand. Of course, what I always talk about in my books about is how to make your customers love your business and increasingly. And one of the three ways that we talk about to get your customers to love your business is to stand for something that they care about. It doesn't necessarily mean that that environmentalism or green has to be everything your company stands for, but if your company is not aligned with their values, and increasingly this is an important value to consumers, then it's gonna be difficult for consumers to love you. It's hard to love somebody who's daily doing something that goes against your values. So uh, we have that business imperative as well as the personal imperative to make sure we take care of our home. Uh, and uh, so when we look at uh, the impact of digital on the environment, um, we recently ran a forced experiment called COVID, and that, as we all know, drove massive increases in the um, in the uh, uh, use of digital for a large number of things, which previously we were doing in other ways, right? Obviously, we all started to telecommute to work and do digital learning, and so many things shifted more rapidly into a digital world because of the forced limitations of COVID. 
And I'm sure you heard on the news that, you know, all of a sudden there were dolphins appearing in bays that hadn't seen them in a hundred years. And the, the canals of Venice, which nobody had been able to see through that water in, in generations, all of a sudden were clear and there were fish. And, you know, after a few months even of that kind of a rest of so many of the negative environmental consequences of prior generations of technology, like cars and factory exhausts and things like that, uh, you could see the impact on the environment. And here's some satellite photos of Wuhan, China, obviously the one of the first places that was locked down. And you can see uh, the, the, the impact from January of 2019 to January of 2020, if, you're, if you are watching this. And if you're just listening, um, just know that uh, there's plenty of satellite photography that looks at the pollution in the air, among other uh, environmental indicators that shows that there's been very substantial positive impact from that reduction in um, traditional sort of carbon emitting technologies. And so while the goal wasn't to become more digital, the goal was to avoid coronavirus, when we shifted a lot of things to a digital realm, uh, and to be fair, we also just plain old shut some things down, like just shut factories down that weren't replaced by digital. So it's not all about digital, but I think this is just one indicator of the potential power of more digital ways of going about our lives that have the potential to be more green. But let's, let's get into more specifics. I'm gonna talk about eight ways that I think digital is already helping to uh, make us greener. And if we continue down these eight paths, they may be the key to enabling us to be even more green in the future. So first of all, digital is enabling us to use less. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, for 25 plus years, we've been talking about the paperless office, right? How can we make more of our documents, uh, uh, you know, electronic and, and have fewer file folders and all these types of things. And certainly um, much of that has occurred uh, when you go into an office. In a, when I was started my career, most offices had hallways lined with file cabinets to handle all the paper. And uh, now, of course, so much of that is digital. And furthermore, it's not just paper. Think about, uh, for example, the DVD industry that we used to produce massive numbers of DVDs. Remember when AOL littered the world with CD-ROMs? You know, there were landfills full of those AOL CD-ROMs. Obviously now, you know, even though that was a kind of digital technology, the latest generation of digital technologies, of course, with streaming videos to our homes, with, you know, increasingly uh, viewing books on Kindles, uh, the, the percentage of books sold electronically just keeps growing and growing and growing every year. Not that I have anything against printed books. I have a printed book out right now and I hope you go buy it. But if you look at the big picture, we are of course seeing that many, particularly in the media industry, areas that were creating uh, consumable um, stuff that then not only had to be created, which requires manufacturing, has to be transported, which requires carbon emission for trucks and other things that are shipping, airplanes that are shipping all this stuff, whether it's books or CDs or v tapes or whatever it may be, as well as um, the landfill and the issues of dealing with the garbage, right? Then when it's garbage, it has to be more carbon is emitted to take it from your house to the dump, and then it has to be dealt with from a landfill perspective or somehow otherwise destroyed. So many, many environmental benefits to the areas in which digital has enabled us to use less. And as I said, these are trends that, they're definitely indicators that these trends are already impacting us. But imagine if we were able to continue to figure out ways to apply digital so that we could use, just not need to create, not, you know, basically avoid the need to uh, print as much stuff or build as much stuff or whatever it may be. So not everything can be replaced by digital, of course, but to the degree we're able to do this, this is how digital enables us to do less. So that's the first way of my eight ways that I want to talk about, about how digital is helping us be more green. So the second is to share more. So obviously we still need cars. We still need apartments. We still are going to make airplanes. We're not going to avoid making those things the way we may now be avoiding making CDs and DVDs, but digital and digital platforms and the sharing economy as it's been, as been dubbed are enabling us to better leverage the things we create. If you think about a car car sharing, more and more millennials and younger who are living in cities, for example, are saying, you know, I don't need to buy a car. I can just Uber where I need to go. Well, that's one less car that's on the road. That's one less car that needs to be manufactured, that needs to be transported, that needs to be destroyed when it's finished, that needs to go into a dump somewhere. Uh, all the effort to mine the metal and build every part of it. That's essentially, you know, by, by being able to share more, we're able to meet all of our needs with less. And whether that's um, whether that's uh, Uber or, or Lyft, but you know, NetJets for sharing aircraft, Airbnb, so that we don't 
we don't waste so much. You know, when you think about um, a, a vacation home that you you live in uh, three, four, five weeks a year, and it's empty the rest of the time, uh, platforms like Airbnb allow other people to use that home when you're not using it, which hopefully means that there's another home that doesn't have to be built. You know, it reminds me a little bit years ago when I worked in an office. At one point, I had my own office, even though I was traveling most of the time. And so there was an office when I was when I worked for a big company that sat empty most of the time. And for a number of years, that's how it was. That was Howard's office. And when Howard wasn't there, it was locked. But it wasn't just Howard. There were tons of people in my same position. You could go to a, a our office floor and there might only be a third of the office occupied because the other two thirds, those people weren't there. Then my company went to this concept called hoteling, which some people resisted, but it was an early example of this kind of sharing where we had an electronic system. When you were in the office, you booked an office, you had an office when you needed it, and you didn't need it when you weren't there. And by doing that, the company was able to get rid of several floors. The next time the lease came up, they canceled the lease on several of the floors of the building because they just didn't need so much real estate. So that's sharing more, using less. That's, of course, more economically efficient for the company. They weren't doing it to try to be more green, but that was one less floor that we needed to air condition, one less floor we needed to heat, one less floor that needed to be cleaned, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, that floor wound up getting used by another company. So it still was being air conditioned and heated. But if you do enough of that, then that's a whole less building that needs to be built, et cetera. So by sharing more, you know, that's another way of really using less. We can manufacture less, like in my number one example, like we don't need to make the DVDs anymore, or we can manufacture things, but manufacture fewer of them and by, because we can share them. Okay, so let's go to number three. Number three is waste less. So what waste less really means is extending the life of things or avoiding uh, you know, unnecessarily using, and I can see there's a little bit of overlap between some of these topics, but for example, uh, you know, look at um, smart homes and smart buildings that are using digital technology to intelligently figure out when people are in a room and it needs to be cooled or it needs to be illuminated or it doesn't, <clears throat> or using technology to figure out when's the best time to run the air conditioning unit and build up reserves of cold. So the uh, that's being done at a time that's more, more, you know, using electricity that's already in the grid and therefore avoiding them to need to spin up extra, um, extra plants, extra power plants to feed more energy during the day. There's so many ways in which smart buildings, whether they're commercial buildings or homes, are using less energy. And of course, using less energy is one of the key ways in which we care for the environment because the generation of energy through things like coal plants of course, is one of the most harmful things that we do for the environment. Um, and uh, But it's also not just electricity. Think of digital tools that are enabling us to avoid car accidents and detect when there's other, other, uh, other cars that may be in the lane or that are automatically braking if the car in front of us stops suddenly. So how does this avoid waste? Well, of course, if you total your car, it becomes waste, right? And it has to be junked. And now you need a, you need a new car. So now we need to create a new car rather than continuing the life of that car. Um, or uh, think about all the different digital tools that allow equipment to be properly serviced and maintained to extend its life. Many, uh, for example, factory equipment now has all kinds of sensors, internet of things, um, smart uh, detectors that gather data and are able to determine when something needs to be serviced. So it can be, it can be fixed before something catastrophic happens that maybe perhaps makes the uh, whole piece of equipment need to be replaced or requires a much larger fix, requiring more energy and more new supplies or more new parts. By detecting problems in advance, we're able to more effectively service and maintain things and extend their life. And furthermore, when we need to do a repair, things like augmented reality make it possible for us to do those rep repairs more accurately and more effectively, meaning perhaps there are things previously that wouldn't have been repaired because it'd be too tricky. And now it can be done because of augmented reality job aids that allow, I know the military makes extensive use of this so that they can make sure that if they need to repair something in the field, that the soldiers that are working on it have the maximum digital tools to enable them to really understand the complexities of how something needs to be repaired. So here's a variety of ways in which essentially we're either using less energy, we're wasting less energy, or we're extending the life of things so they don't become waste, but rather continue to be uh, usable. Um, so the next is uh, digital is enabling us to drive less. Now, why does that matter? Well, because most cars today are, um, you know, are based on an internal combustion engine and that generates emissions and those emissions create CO2 and other pollutants. And this is one of the contributors, one of the significant contributors to our environmental problems. 
So how does digital enable us to drive less? Well, you know, uh, as we saw during the pandemic, uh, through uh, the ability to use tools like Zoom and and be more able, more people able to work more remotely to teleconference, it means that maybe instead of having to commute into the city five days a week, you're only commuting into the city three days a week. Or maybe it enables you to go off and be an independent freelancer and you never commute into the city anymore and you work from home. This reduction in commuting is one example of how we're able to drive less. Um, also, if you look at companies like Amazon or Instacart that are able to deliver things to your home, hopefully that's saving you trips to the store, less time driving around, uh, doing your errands. Uh, and of course, there's multiple benefits to all this, right? It's not just about the environment. In fact, the environment may not even be the main reason we're doing these things. It makes our lives more convenient. It frees up leisure time. Uh, you know, it, 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 it um, in the, you know, it's say in the case of something like Zoom and telecommuting, it saves money for companies that allows them to use talent in a more diverse range of geographic areas. So many, many, many benefits. And like I say, environmentalism may not be the first, second or third reason. But nevertheless, what we're talking about today is how some of these things have the potential to be helpful. And I, the reduction in this kind of driving around time is one way that I would suggest uh, these things have the potential to help um, help the environment. Now, we're going to talk a little later about um, some of the ways in which they may be harmful as well. So this is a little bit of a scale, right? Something can be helpful in one way, but harmful in another way. Obviously, something like Amazon, um, you know, they're using a heck of a lot of cardboard boxes that you wouldn't use if you're going to the store and just buying something and bringing it home yourself. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have the skill to weigh those two things against each other. But anyway, let's keep going and, and hopefully this spurs some thinking for you. And I would love your thoughts in the, in the comments, by the way, or even to toss them into the, um, into the chat right now. If you have any thoughts about any of these things that I'm mentioning, if you agree, if you disagree, or you think that, uh, you know, they're somehow oversimplified. Of course, they're oversimplified. We only have a limited time here today. I'm just trying to cover some high level topics, but that's fine. Let me know what are some of those complexities that I may not have had time or knowledge enough to talk about during this uh, brief session. So uh, the next one I want to talk about is greener transport. So it's one thing to be able to um, just not need to drive around as much, not need to commute as much, not need to go to the store as much. Uh, but also when we transport ourselves or goods, and uh, we have new ways of providing greener transport. Obviously, electric cars are or not just cars, but electric cars, trucks, buses, other kinds of electric vehicles. Maybe someday we'll have an electric, you know, airplane and commercial aviation will be able to use electric. I don't know. Um, these are obviously uh, one of the first things we think about when we think of how digital and digital technologies are helping us uh, be more green. But, you know, there are other angles of transportation as well. I mean, for example, when, you know, I mentioned earlier that one of the benefits of uh, digital is that you don't have to go to the store. Well, that's true, but you might say, but Howard, somebody still has to bring that stuff to me. Some driver is still getting in a truck and driving to my house and dropping the packages off, whether it's groceries or stuff you order from Amazon or Macy's or whatever. That's true. Uh, so there's some carbon emission, unless, of course, you're driving an electric vehicle, which most today are not. Uh, but through digital technology like GPS and route planning software, we're able to very often optimize those routes so that instead of five different people leaving their houses, and driving to the grocery store and coming home, we're able to have one small light van, for example, load up with your groceries and then have a computer figure out what's the optimal route for that van to go. It's like, it's essentially like carpooling for your groceries, right? <laughs> you know, if you carpool to work, yes, you're still driving in a car, but five of you are in a car rather than one. And this is really the same thing when you order things online, because that truck is not driving from the store, the warehouse to your house and going back to the warehouse or the store. They're generally going on a route that's taking them around, dropping a number of things off. And, you know, I mentioned that these are all things that are helping today, but one could imagine them going even farther. And one of the things that Amazon, for example, is doing now is it's encouraging customers to sign up for one delivery day a week. So rather than if you're a household like mine that has Am seems to have Amazon packages continuously arriving, seven people live in my house and several people work here. So between everybody and everything that gets ordered, I think there's an Amazon package arrives just about every day. And Amazon's trying to encourage uh, consumers that if your order is not urgent, pick a day and you can have all your Amazon packages delivered on the same day. So that truck only has to come to your house once. That's one example of how we can even further optimize those types of, um, of interactions. And perhaps we'll also start to see more consolidation. You know, obviously we have FedEx, UPS, USPS, 
I, you know, perhaps in the future, some of this will get further consolidated so that there's only one truck that's coming to your house rather than three different trucks having to come or other services will work together so that if Instacart's coming to your house and there's a FedEx package for you, they can bring that as well. I, you know, I'm just speculating this stuff doesn't exist today, but I would say that digital has the potential to enable these things. If these companies have some sort of a back end that talks to each other and can recognize when there's an opportunity to bundle deliveries together and have fewer times a truck needs to roll to your house, then, well, I think that's the sort of thing where digital can take this idea of greener transport even farther. Okay, let's move on to our next one. Understanding the planet. Key to our ability to be good stewards of the planet and really understand the impact of the uh, choices that we make, the environmental impact that we're having, as well as how to uh, try to conserve and preserve, whether they're um, endangered species or endangered ecosystems like wetlands or other jungles, other places. The more we understand about the planet and the, how our whole ecosystem works, the better able we'll be to do a good job of moving us in the direction of green. And there are a number of digital technologies that help us to do that. Certainly satellite imaging is one, and uh, one of our clients, Airbus, has a whole bunch of satellites circling the Earth. And not only can they detect, not only can take photos of the Earth, which can, which can help greatly in understanding deforestation or uh, you know, impact of rainfall or other things, but they can also use other kinds of light like infrared or ultraviolet wavelengths of light to see other things like the amount of nitrogen that's in the soil and things like that. So satellite uh, t uh, photography helps us, and that it's not only taking the photographs from the satellite, but then it's okay, once you have thousands and thousands of satellites you've taken from the sky, how do you knit that together the way the Google Earth does so you can look at it all? Or how do you create artificial intelligence algorithms that run against it to try to try to glean insight and data that actually becomes actionable in things like environmental policy or manufacturing or emissions or places that we need to go and take some sort of action like protect, protect wildlife species or plant more trees or whatever it might be. So. Um, and, and not only satellites, you know, drones are another amazing technology that allow us to get a different kind of view, a different kind of angle on the earth and study places that may be remote or that may be impractical for scientists to get to it for one reason or another to make sure we continue to gather as much data as we can about what's going on in all the different ecosystems around the earth. And um, another example of, of, you know, environmental science and, and making sure that we have as much knowledge as possible of what's going on in our environmental ecosystems are things like smart tags, which can be put on the collars of animals. You know, I'm sure you're familiar, probably saw, I remember watching videos 30 years ago in grade school about how they would tag animals in the wild so that they could study them. And, but, you know, in the past, many of those tags were just like printed tags, and then they had to find the animal again in order to know what happened to that animal. And now you have smart tags where animals can have a, a small tag added on a collar or somehow other attached to the animal. I'm sure the animals probably don't love that, but uh, it's done for a greater good of being able to study an animal population and real-time data can come back to help us understand, you know, what's the migration pattern of an animal or how many of them are left or what's happening with that species. And you could do the same thing with weather. You probably remember in the, in the, in the movie, um, uh, the one with Helen Hunt about the tornado. I forget what that movie was called. Was it called Tornado? I don't think so. Well, anyway, they would send IOT sensors up into the tornado system so they could see the, the, the pattern of the tornado. And again, the more we are able to use technology to study things like weather systems, animal ecologies, plant ecologies, uh, study pollution, all these types of things with sensors. These are just more ways that we can understand the planet better. And hopefully that empowers scientists to both create a burning platform for policy changes, as well as come up with new technologies that have the potential to do things like absorb carbon, protect animals, things like that. Okay, moving on. The next is educate. So once we have all that knowledge and data that scientists are able to capture through uh, various digital technologies, Digital also has the potential to make sure that people can really understand what's going on. You know, uh, democratized media, places like YouTube that allow content to be created that educate the world about our environment and about new technologies or new policies that can help more positively impact the environment. These are powerful tools to spread the word to make sure that uh, that knowledge is, is not controlled by a small number of large companies that may have interests that are different from you know, the sort of general population and the environment, but can be can be sent out far and wide, not just in this country, but around the world. And, you know, Google Earth is just one small example of that. The, the mere fact that you have the ability to essentially zoom in and look at any part of the planet at a pretty high resolution is a powerful educational tool for people who are trying to study what different ecosystems look like. And of course, as I say, videos and other content 
that allow that message to get out as well. So that edu the educational component of digital, I think, is a powerful tool in helping impact and influence people's behavior around environmentalism. And even more so, perhaps, is the power of digital to mobilize people. Uh, you know, of course, um, one of the ways in which uh, policy is impacted and people's mindsets are impacted and so much of environmental environmentalism, so much of what we need to do to take better care of the earth comes down to driving human behavior. And so everything from using digital to create flash mobs, if someone's organizing a, a physical protest of some sort, these have become increasingly powerful tools for organizers who are looking to do some kind of uh, you know protest or demonstration type activity. But then in addition, uh, and perhaps that's what this you know picture is showing that says there is no planet B, but all at the same time, images of those types of events or other images and memes that can be sent out on social media, for example, are another powerful tool to help mobilize people and get people to take action. As well as frankly, the ability to just promote what might be niche products that are more helpful for the environment. Uh, now that we have a much more democratized commercial channel for getting products out so that anyone can go on Kickstarter or sell a product on eBay or Amazon Marketplace or Facebook Marketplace and promote it through social media. You don't need the buy-in of a large company to bring a product to mass market. And so products which are more environmentally friendly, which perhaps wouldn't be as embraced by larger companies, perhaps because they're less profitable, for example, we also have tools and digital methods for those to get out. So that's that whole idea of mobilizing uh, you know, education is really just let learn, helping people learn. Mobilizing is more about getting people to take action. Um, so those were the eight areas that I wanted to talk about in terms of uh, ways in which I see digital as a force for good relative to the environment. I do want to talk about, before we wrap here, just a couple of the downsides because, you know, rarely is there anything in the world that's all good or all evil. And I really believe digital is a force for good relative to the world of the environment, certainly much more so than our prior generations of technology like the industrial age. However, there are definitely some issues with digital. One is digital can consume a lot of power. Just the mining of digital currency alone, just the mining, which happens on servers, is currently consuming a third of a percentage of all the power consumed on Earth. That is a very energy intensive activity. So that might not sound like much, but when you think about what a you know relatively small part of the universe mining Bitcoins is, or not just Bitcoins, but uh, all the other um, cryptocurrencies, uh, a third of our power on Earth is being used just for that. And of course, this is a growing area. So one can imagine that that's going to grow. So that just gives you a sense, but let, let's go on. All of the data centers in the world, by one estimate, use approximately 500 terawatts of power. And uh, that in order to generate 500 terawatts of power, you would need something like 200 giant coal-fired plants. And while, of course, there are other ways of generating electricity, today, most of our electricity is still generated by coal-fired plants, which, of course, are bad in many ways for the environment. And so uh, in order to drive, and this is just the, just the server side, this isn't even the devices. This is just the data centers side of our digital world of, of the internet and related technology. So um, the amount of power that needs to be consumed in order to run these digital capabilities, certainly uh, I don't know that it, it sort of balances against all the other things that I said, but clearly it, it is still consuming natural resources and generating pollution and things like that in a way which is, which is a negative, goes in the negative column relative to um, the impact of digital on the environment. Um, oh, there. And, um, but, you know, we are starting to see some um, movement toward more types of renewable energy. Apple, for example, not only has uh, uh, covered their new headquarters with um, uh, solar panels, and of course the headquarters is not where their data centers are, but they've also created giant fields of solar panels near their data centers in an attempt to try to power their data centers as much as possible with renewable energy. And as we see more and more of a trend in this direction, perhaps connecting to what I talked about at the beginning of this, of this show, the importance to consumers that companies are thinking about renewable energy or just their own sense of value about what they care about. Uh, hopefully, we're going to see while this amount of power is still needed, the potential for the power source to shift from less environmentally friendly sources like coal to more environmentally friendly sources like solar and wind. Um, and lastly, digital devices, they do create and use a lot of poisonous stuff. You know, this is one of the reasons why when your iPhone is, when you're done with your iPhone, you can't just throw it in the garbage, right? 
The battery is filled with all kinds of horrible chemicals that contaminate the groundwater. The silicon, the, 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 the computer chips themselves contain things like mercury and other lead and other nasty compounds. Also in the manufacturing of these devices, there's a lot of really nasty chemicals that are used. Um, it also takes a lot of energy to create all these things. A couple of quick statistics. Um, creating one PC computer uses, according to one source, 1.5 uh, tons of water, 1.5 tons of water in the total creation of a PC. And I'm sure that includes all the different manufacturing components that have to be manu manufactured from the case to the hard drive, to the chips, to the motherboard, and the transportation of all that stuff, the, the shipping it to the consumer, the cardboard box, but all together, one computer is using 1.5 tons of water and uses or consumes 22 kilograms, and a kilogram is like a few pounds, right? So like call that like 50 plus pounds of harmful chemicals. They're either in the, in the device itself, obviously the device doesn't contain 50 pounds of chemicals, either in the final device or used in the manufacturing of the device and then becomes waste when the device is manufactured. And again, I'm sure that adds up all the different components so it's not all used for one manufacturing process because of course computers are assembled from a whole bunch of different component parts. I don't have that data for smartphones and tablets, but I'm guessing it might be less, but it's probably similar. There's still a lot of uh, nasty stuff that gets consumed both in the creation of these devices and when they are discarded. So perhaps we can leverage some more of the um, topics we talked earlier, more sharing, less waste. Uh, in any case, this is just another way in which the digital world is taking away from the environment a little bit while it's contributing. Personally, I'd still like to feel that the net impact is massively positive, but I didn't want to leave the topic without at least acknowledging that there are some areas that we in the digital world can continue to work on to make sure that our impact is as exclusively positive as possible. And I just end by suggesting if everyone that's listening to this and is working in the digital space in honor of Earth Day, take a look and think about what you're doing as a company. Is there more that you can do to reduce your negative environmental impact? Of course, that's the purpose of Earth Day. We all want to be asking that question. But also, is there more that you could be doing to create that positive environmental impact, to help people share more, to reduce waste, et cetera? All those eight things that I talked about earlier. So uh, hopefully this was interesting, a big, wide topic. i very looking forward to the kinds of comments and additional thoughts you guys may have. So lay them on me. As a reminder, I will be in Clubhouse for a little while after this. I see some of you are listening in Clubhouse right now. So if anyone wants to join me in Clubhouse, I will welcome you there. And until next time, thank you again for listening and watching the Winning Digital Customer Show. I'll look forward to seeing you next time.